Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. The title of our message today is Nebuchadnezzar Comes Crashing Down, Daniel chapter 4 verses 1 through 37. And over the years, this particular chapter has, has been one that you just kind of scratch your head at quite often. You look at this chapter and you say, how can it be? This is different than anything I, I have ever heard of. And yet, uh, we're going to find out the message that comes to Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings that we find in the Bible, uh, through this particular chapter within Daniel. Now, Daniel chapter 4 is different than any other chapter that's in the Bible, in that it's a, a letter, the entire chapter is a letter, that's written by a pagan king to the people of his empire. And he does this after he goes through this incredible experience that many people believe lasted for a period of eight years. Now, I can't say with certainty that it lasted that entire time period, but many people believe that it went for a period of eight years and perhaps three years before the end of his life. Nebuchadnezzar ends up writing this letter and, and sending it out after this long journey of, of three previous chapters in which he, he talks about God, God being the God of gods, and yet at the same time, he's polytheistic, which which means that Nebuchadnezzar believes in many gods. But he's got a real problem, and he's got the problem of pride. In fact, as we, we work in here, what we find out is that God deals with the pride of Nebuchadnezzar before the end of his life, and here we find Nebuchadnezzar's swan song, if you would, within the Bible. Now, when I say one of the greatest kings that, that we find in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned 90 times, which means he's got a really significant role, and now we're coming to the end of that time period. But I'm going to go ahead and pick it up today in, in Daniel chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 37. We're going to be moving pretty quickly. In fact, I'm going to ask, if you would, to, to please stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Daniel chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs! How mighty his wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, at times, dreams can be eerie, can't they? Have you ever had a nightmare in the middle of the night and you ask, where did that come from? Or you wake up and your heart's going 100 beats a minute on different things that have happened. Is, is this something that's going to happen? Is this really going to happen to me at some point? Well, Nebuchadnezzar had had dreams before. In fact, we find out that he had had a dream approximately 30 years earlier. Uh, most people believe that about 30 years has passed now at this point from 605 when he took Daniel into to captivity. And, and the period that we're at right now. Nebuchadnezzar reigned from 605 to 562 BC for a period of 43 years, and we're probably in the last 10 years of his life here. So as we go through this chapter, remember that Daniel has increased in age as well. Uh, Daniel's up there when he was taken into captivity. He was probably 14 or 15 years old, and, and now uh, you can add another 30 years to that. So he's getting up, and he's somewhere in the area between 45 and 50 years old at this point. But verse 1, we see the purpose of the letter. In fact, there's, there's four parts to, to this, this uh, chapter, the entire chapter, which is written by Nebuchadnezzar, whom Daniel, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, went ahead and included it into his book, into the scriptures. But part 1 is going to be the, the reason for the letter. Part 2 is going to be the dream. Part 3, we're going to see, is the interpretation of the dream. And part four is going to be Nebuchadnezzar's changed life. And we're going to see how all of this came about as God directed it. Daniel chapter four, beginning with verse one, says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, 
to all the peoples, the nations, the languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. This chapter has always seemed so strange to me because Nebuchadnezzar disappears for such a prolonged period of time. And many of the experts believe that, that it, this chapter covers a period of about eight years. It covers the initial dream that he had, talking to Daniel. It covers the one year of grace that was given to him by God in order to repent. And then perhaps as many as seven years in which he's gone and he's temporarily insane. And so eight years may have gone by. And if that's the case, and, and, and I'm going to give some other explanations as we go too. But if that's the case, many of the people are wondering, where's the king? Where's the king been? And so as he writes this letter, he begins to explain to them his prolonged absence, where he was, and what was accomplished through that. Verse 2, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High has worked for me. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has seen signs and wonders before. In fact, last week in Daniel chapter 3, we saw that uh, uh, the three men were, were put into the fiery furnace, and there was a, a fourth man who was like a son of God, who ended up delivering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar was there, and to his amazement, he watched all of this that happened as they went into this furnace that could have been 1,800 degrees or hotter, and they're walking around like nothing happened. He had seen that. But there's a difference here, because this time when he starts talking about it, Nebuchadnezzar is talking about the signs and wonders that didn't happen to Meshach, uh, and Abednego, and, and, and Shadrach. But he's talking about signs and wonders that in this particular case, that he experienced them himself. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar has been in a learning process. In fact, if you remember that initial dream that he had in Daniel chapter 2, he had the, uh, the dream of, of this figure with a, a, a golden head, and he had silver uh, for the arms and, and the chest, and uh, his, his waist and his thighs were, were covered in bronze, and then uh, we had iron legs and, and, and feet of iron that were mixed with clay. And the essence of this dream was Nebuchadnezzar was the head. That was made clear. But that each empire would be swallowed up by the next one. And so these empires were not permanent. These empires were not eternal. They were here for a season, and they were going to be gone. So Nebuchadnezzar knew that. That was the essence of the dream. The Babylonian Empire, which was the first, would be swallowed up by the Medo-Persian, and it would work its way on down. And Nebuchadnezzar had been horribly troubled by that dream, but Daniel had, had worked through all of that with him. But the thing that he learns now is that he's not going to be eternal. His kingdom's not going to be eternal, but God's kingdom is. God's kingdom will last forever and ever. And so with that introduction that we see here, it says, peace be multiplied to you. Uh, I thought it good to declare the signs and the wonders of the Most High God who ha has worked for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And then after this brief introduction, what Nebuchadnezzar does is he jumps into uh, what the dream was that he saw. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. We get a bit of an idea there what's going on in his mind. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring all of the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make it known to me. Now, my question in this is, is why did he go back when they couldn't answer the dream before? Why did Nebuchadnezzar go back to the, the magicians and the astrologers and the soothsayers and ask them to come in to, to, to open up this dream to him. Why didn't he just go to Daniel? And I have to believe that with Daniel's position in government, that perhaps Daniel was out of town. Perhaps he was on official business somewhere. But he goes ahead and he calls them. But you notice the difference this time, because in Daniel chapter 2, when the king brought him in, he said he wasn't going to share the dream with them. They had to tell him, number one, the dream. Then number two, they had to tell him the interpretation. But this time he tells them what the dream is, and they still can't give the answer to this dream. 
So in verse 8 it said, but at last Daniel came before me. And his name is Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. Now, there's an interesting point here because this is a letter that's written from the king. He's writing out to his people, and he uses the name Daniel. Remember, up until that point, he had used the name Belshazzar. Why would he use the name Belshazzar? That was the Babylonian name for him. In other words, it was named after Nebuchadnezzar's God. And, and it means, Bel, protect me or Marduk, protect me. It was, it was the God there. Uh, Daniel means God is my judge, or Yahweh is my judge. And perhaps the king had come to the point in which he had learned at this point that Daniel's God was much more powerful than Bel. So his name is Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. Three times this is said, Nebuchadnezzar realizes that, that the spirit of God is within Daniel. In him is the Spirit of God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians. Now, this is a title, a pagan title that's been given to him by the Babylonians. He said, because I know that the Spirit of the Holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen in its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while I laid on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree. So here the object is the, the tree. And behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to all the ends of the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud, and he said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it, and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with dew of heaven. Let him gaze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. The decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. Give it to whomever he will, and he sets over it the lowest of men. Verse 18. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for here we see it again, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. And so now we've gone through the first two parts of Daniel, the introduction and the dream, and now we're going to go into part three, which is the interpretation of the dream. Verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. You know, it's, it's amazing. You see Daniel here, and he's got this unique ability to be able to see the dreams, to be able to interpret the dreams that other individuals are having. And so God has given him the interpretation of this dream, but he's stunned. He can't believe the things that, that, that he sees. In fact, the Bible describes it is that he's astonished. And the troubled look on his face is absolutely evident to the king. Verse 19b, so the king spoke and he said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. This is absolutely amazing to me because here you've got the individual who had been called before the king of kings. This is the most powerful king in the entire world. He's got this dream that's driving him nuts. He's so worried about it. But Daniel's face, the expression on his face was so troubled that now we find the king taking the role of comforting Daniel and saying, Daniel, Daniel, don't let it trouble you too much. Don't, don't, don't worry about this. We see in uh, 
Verse 19b, it says, once again, it says, uh, uh, it, it continues on here, and it says, Belshazzar answered, and he said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. <sighs> Nebuchadnezzar says to Daniel, he says, don't worry about this dream. I mean, I mean don't let it bother you that much. And, and Daniel's really struggling. He's saying, oh, Lord, you know, or, or uh, King, I, I don't want to... I don't even want to tell you what this is about. I, I really wish that the interpretation of this dream was pointing to your enemies so that they were the ones who would have to go through this and, and not you, my king. What's amazing to me is what king was it that had taken Daniel captive? What king was it that went into Jerusalem and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple, burning it down and killed thousands of Jews it was King Nebuchadnezzar. You would think that Daniel would have been delighted. Oh man, he's going to get his payback. This is payback time. And yet Daniel somehow has gotten to the point where he is just so troubled. How could he get to that point? And I have to believe that in Daniel's heart that he had gotten to the point where he had forgiven him. He had forgiven King Nebuchadnezzar. He had, he had worked loyally under him. He hated to see anyone being hurt. But the key part here is I believe that Daniel had forgiven King Nebuchadnezzar for the things that happened. Otherwise, he couldn't have been troubled. He would have been glad by the things in which he, he saw. Why is forgiveness so important to our spiritual health? I'll tell you what, because if we don't forgive, it's going to affect every part of our spiritual health. It's going to affect our relationships. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13 say this. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, close yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive even as the Lord forgave you. Wow. Stop and think about how many times the Lord's forgiven you in your life. I mean, James 2.10 says, For whosoever should keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of what? All. He's guilty of all. And yet time and time again, God has forgiven us for the things that we've done in our lives. And that's the standard that we're to set out and we're to forgive people. Otherwise, it's going to rip at us spiritually and we're going to have difficulty in our walk with the Lord. Verses 20 through 22. The tree that you saw which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which, which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and the fruit was abundant and which the food was for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt. And in those branches, the birds of heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. So what was the object of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? It was this massive tree that was filled with fruit. It was filled with leaves that the animals and the birds came for, for coverage and protection. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this. It says, like the tree, Nebuchadnezzar had become great and strong in his kingdom and been expanded and consolidated, which had been expanded and consolidated under his rule. His kingdom had become greater than any kingdom up until that time. So the gigantic tree that Nebuchadnezzar was seeing was actually a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. It was a picture of him and the results of his kingdom. You see, the tree was sometimes used as a symbol representing leaders in the Old Testament. It's interesting that when archaeologists got into to Babylon and they started looking, they found in one of the buildings an, an inscription in there in which Babylon is compared to a spreading tree. And here we've got that same illustration in the Bible that's talking about the tree being representative of King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in verses 23 and 24, it reads as such, And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and root in the earth, bound, uh, bound with a, a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be with the dew of heaven 
and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High. And when a decree is given, it's something that's going to happen. This is the decree of the, old, uh, of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. Well, first of all, who was the watcher, the holy one? This is a reference to an angel. And in fact, the word angel or, or angelos actually in, in the Greek or even within the Hebrew can mean messenger. And so when we see the, the angel who's coming, it's a messenger. The cutting down and the stripping of the leaves, the fruit, and, and, and the entire tree symbolizes the disgracing of King Nebuchadnezzar. So here we see the divine lumberjack with that axe back ready to bring that big old tree down to make a point and to teach the king something. But notice that the trunk remains, and that trunk that remains indicates that Nebuchadnezzar would not be completely uprooted. In fact, God would keep the kingdom together during his absence. But what's meant here by the timing? This is where it gets pretty interesting in, in trying to figure out how long of a period is this insanity that Nebuchadnezzar is going to go through? How long is it, it, it lasting? Well, there's three main interpretations to it. Number one, we've, we see that the seven times pass over him might mean the number seven represents the com complete number of time that Nebuchadnezzar was insane and absent from his throne. It could mean, secondly, that the number seven represents seven months of insanity and absence from his, his throne. But the question here, we're going to end up seeing later on that during that period of time that his, uh, his hair grew like bird's feathers. His nails were, were like bird's nails. And the imagery is given there. How long does that take? How long would it take for that period of time to go? I mean, for me to realize that the, kingdom, that the king was gone from the kingdom for seven months is much more easier to explain from our point of view than seven years. That's a long period of time for, for a king to disappear. So number one, it could mean whatever that complete amount of time was that Nebuchadnezzar was gone. That's what it's referring to. Or it could mean that he was gone for a period of seven months. Or it can mean that the number seven represents seven full years of insanity and absence from the throne. Now, as you read through the majority of the commentaries and the scholars, almost everyone believes that it's for a period of seven years, that for seven years the king disappears, and that just raises all kinds of questions. But many believe it's the number seven is literal years because of what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. In Daniel 7.25, it's talking about the Antichrist. It's talking about the end times. He shall speak pompous words. In other words, speaking of, of the uh, Antichrist, pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change the times and the laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hands for a time, times and a half. What is that times, times and a half in the end times? That's the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. And so in that particular case, it's talking about seven full years, or it would seem to indicate that. But how could you possibly explain the king being absent for a period of seven years? Well, we find another story similar to that in Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon's history. The Reformation Bible study reports this. It says, Babylon records long periods of absence and blasphemous acts by King uh, Nabonidus, who ruled from 556 to 539 B.C. Resemble in some ways Daniel's accounts of Nebuchadnezzar. Another composition called the Prayer of uh, Nabonidus has been discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, documents hidden uh, before A.D. 70 by a Jewish community at Qumran and found in 1947. This prayer is also similar to that of Daniel, uh, what he says about Nebuchadnezzar. Nabonidus is separated from society, you ready for this? For seven years, and he's restored with the help of a Jewish exile after confession of his sins. However, his affliction, as described, is a form of skin disease rather than mental illness. And so historically we find that there was another king that for a while ended up disappearing. We'll get into that a, a little bit later on. Verse 25, they shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like ox. 
They shall wet you with dew of heaven, and seven times, there's that seven again, seven times shall pass till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives to whomever he chooses. But it says, they shall drive you away. My question here is, who's the they that they're talking about? Are they talking about demons that have affected Nebuchadnezzar, that have turned him to be like an animal, and he ends up heading on out to wherever he ends up going? Or when this happened, is it possible that the loyal leadership that was around him ended up getting him away from the kingdom and somehow tried to work the situation through so that he could be restored at some point in the future? I, I don't know, but there's a, it's interesting to take a look at that. Well, several years later, Daniel goes ahead and he explains to Belshazzar, who's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a few more details about this incident. So we can pick up a little bit more in Daniel chapter 5, verse 20. But when his, meaning Nebuchadnezzar's heart, was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. So when he got up to this point, God ends up removing him. They took the glory from him. He's de deposed from the kingly throne. And then in Daniel chapter 5, verse 21, we find out yet another interesting fact here. It says, then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with wild donkeys. They fed him grass like oxen, and the body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and he appointed over it whomever he chooses. What's important for us to see here is, is that Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's driven out with the donkeys. That fact is added here. But at the bottom of this verse, we see why it was done. That until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. We see the purpose behind in, in, uh, also in Daniel chapter 4, verse 25b, in which it says, till you know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men. And once again, there it is, gives it to whom, whomever he chooses. So in verse Daniel chapter 5, it's covered. Daniel chapter 4, the exact same thing is said here. It's interesting that people take offense to the sovereignty of God so often, isn't it? And what, what does the sovereignty of God mean? It means that God rules, that God reigns. And a God who is not sovereign, ladies and gentlemen, is no God at all. I mean, God is, in, is sovereign over all of the events that are taking place. That's part of the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar is learning. It wasn't him. It was God who was at work in his kingdom who had enabled him to do the things in which he had done. But I think the reason that so many people have trouble with the sovereignty of God today is because people want to be in control. People want to run things. They don't want anyone telling them or, or, or indicating what's going to go on in their lives. They want to run things, and that's one of the things that Nebuchadnezzar was struggling with here. Verse 26, and inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and its roots in the tree of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you have come to know that heaven rules. I thought it was interesting. It talks about this band of iron and bronze. You got this tree that comes over the trunks still in the ground, the roots in the ground, indicating it's going to be around for a while. But then there's a band that's put around it of, of iron and bronze. And why would that band be put around it? I believe that the band of iron and bronze around the, the, the trunk indicates that the, the trunk would be strengthened and the trunk would be protected. In other words, the nucleus of the kingdom would remain intact even while Nebuchadnezzar is going through this period of discipline. And notice, too, that there's a term that's used here where it talks about heaven, uh, that uh, after you come to know that heaven rules, and here we've got heaven being used to, to indicate as a synonym for the name of God. Only time in the Old Testament, but when we get to the intertestament, intertestamental period, that term is used over and over again. But what amazes me is that mercy is being offered to the very king who had gone and destroyed Jerusalem. You know, maybe you're here today and, and you said, boy, the things I've done in my life, there's no way God could ever forgive me. But I got to tell you the things that Nebuchadnezzar did. If God could forgive Nebuchadnezzar, if God could work in Nebuchadnezzar's life, God can work in your life. And there's no sin that's above forgiveness. 
Verse 27, Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of prosperity to you. Do you see what's happening here to, to, to Daniel? He sees what's going on. He's horrified by the things in which he sees. And now he gets to this verse and he says, King, repent. Stop now. Get right with God. If you get right with God, perhaps you can avoid the punishments that I'm seeing here. Had Nebuchadnezzar humble himself, God would have had no need to humble Nebuchadnezzar further, but he didn't. But look at what God does. God gives Nebuchadnezzar an entire year. He gives him an additional year. In fact, we notice that the judgment is delayed for 12 months, giving him opportunity to, to repent. That's God in his mercy. Same man who destroyed Jerusalem. I wonder how many of us here today are in that period of mercy or that period of grace that God has granted to us. We've messed up our lives big time on things that we've gone out and the hammer hasn't fallen yet. He's given you the opportunity to repent. If we go beyond that period, whatever that period is, and we don't repent, that hammer is going to end up coming down. But I think verse 27 is great advice for all of us because God has promised that if we're obedient, that he will bless us. But he's also promised in his word, if we're disobedient, that God will curse us. No matter what it is that you've done within your life, we find in 1 John 1, 9, this verse, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Confession and repentance is great because it gets us back in praying ground. It gets us back into a right relationship with the Lord when we mean it, when we go to him in prayer. Verses 28 through 30 of, of Daniel chapter 4 say this, and it says, All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He was walking about, and perhaps a better interpretation for that word, or translation for that word about, could also be upon. He was walking about or upon the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? You see, the buildings had flat roofs. And it's likely that at this point, Nebuchadnezzar was up and he was on the roof and he was admiring the many accomplishments that he had made throughout his kingdom. And it's easy to see how the king could be proud. The Moody Bible Commentary gives us a glimpse of why it would have been so easy for him to be proud. According to Herodotus, the, the Greek historian who died in 425 BC, check this out. Babylon was the most glorious city in the ancient world. He recorded that Babylon's outer walls were 56 miles long, 80 feet wide, 320 feet high. Nebuchadnezzar was a great builder and expanded the city to six miles. He also beautified it with magnificent buildings and temples and palaces. Within the city, there were some 53 temples to various gods, many containing massive gold statues. The main sacred possession, Procession Street, passed from the, passed from the famed Ishtar Gate to the Temple of Marduk, with its adjacent ziggurat rising 288 feet into the sky. A 400-foot bridge spanned the Euphrates River and united the eastern and the western halves of the city. On the northwest corner of the king's primary palace sat one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the famed Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Built on terraces, it more than properly, it more, and more properly should have been, been called overhanging gardens. Whether the ancient historian exaggerated or gave a precise depiction of the city of Babylon, uh, the city of Babylon was indeed the largest, most populous, and greatest city in the known world at the time. Perhaps it was uh, not the roof of the hanging gardens with a view of his glorious, or, excuse me, perhaps it was on the roof of the hanging gardens with a view of his glorious city, and Nebuchadnezzar became filled with pride. Wow, can you imagine that? You look at the ancient world and if he's up on top of that roof and he's looking at the hanging gardens and all of these things and he's so proud about the accomplishments and in which he had accomplished, but where did Nebuchadnezzar go wrong in all of this? What did he do? Well, what he didn't do 
is, well, what he didn't do is he didn't give glory to God. He ended up leaving God out. David Jeremiah says Nebuchadnezzar's sin wasn't that he knew he was talented. His problem was that he considered himself the source of his talent. He wanted the whole world to accomplish, to acknowledge his abilities, and he didn't give credit to the thousands of talented laborers and craftsmen who actually built the city of Babylon, much less God. The sin of pride rears its head when we refuse to acknowledge that all of the good gifts come from God alone. Are you wrestling with pride right now? Is there some area in your life that you're just hanging on to? We think too highly of ourselves when we get to that point, don't we, on pride. If you have any giftedness that you, you, you have for, for ministry or uh, special uh, abilities you have for different works, it's not because you're better than the person next to you. It's because God has gifted you with those abilities. Are you giving him the glory and the honor for that which God has given to you? You see, pride's not a good thing. We see in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And in fact, James gives us some, some great advice in James chapter 4, verse 6, when James says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you want to fight with God, get proud. Nebuchadnezzar was proud, and he ended up fighting with God. God will bring you down if you get to that point. I love what David Jeremiah says. He says, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Think about this, Genesis 1.26. You were created in the image of God. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself or looking down upon yourself. It's thinking of yourself less and thinking of other people more. You see the difference there on humility where Nebuchadnezzar was completely locked in. Verses 31 and 32, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men. Your dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. Seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Look at this. He's up there and he's bragging. Look at the works that I've done. I've done this. I've done that. And he's not even done talking. No sooner does he open his mouth and a voice ends up coming down from heaven. Who is that voice? We're not told. Some people think maybe that voice was God. Others think maybe that voice was an angel. We're not sure exactly who it was, but well, the, the words were still on the king's mouth. Judgment fell from heaven. Why is it, do you think, that so often we get so proud that we don't look to God when we're proud, do we? Why is it that we have to hit rock bottom in our lives before we look up and we see God, before we come to that point of trusting God? I'm not sure why that is, other than we want to hang on to control until we're finally broken by God. Well, some modern critics contend that secular history says nothing about King Nebuchadnezzar's mental illness. But really, would any great king be willing to talk about his mental illness and his most embarrassing moments in his memoirs? I mean, sure, you're, gonna, you're writing your own memoirs. You're going to think of all of the most embarrassing things and put them out there. Would a great king do that? It's no wonder that this wasn't in any of the, the, the secular recordings. Well, people have often questioned how the kingdom could possibly have continued to function for so long in the king's absence. Today, we watch the news, and, and the president of the United States can't go anywhere without being recorded. I mean, he's on TV, he's on different video, he's being recorded. I mean, the poor man can hardly walk into a building to use the restroom without somebody recording the things that he's doing. But it's totally different back in, in, in these days of Babylon, because back here, the news media didn't get the word out like they do today. In fact, there was a whole lot more privacy. Everything took a whole lot more time for all of these events to happen. It was much, much slower. And when Nebuchadnezzar went insane, he had a very helpful second person. That helpful second person was the prophet Daniel. 
He had a prime minister, if you would, in Daniel. In fact, by the time Daniel ends up getting to Persia, he's definitely prime minister. But he's in a position where Daniel can keep things going. So look how quickly that judgment falls in verse 33. It says, that very hour, was uh, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar, that he was driven from men, and he ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with dew, with the dew of heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like birds. Bird's claws. Uh, you take a look. How long would it take for his hair to grow like bird's feathers? How long would it take for those nails to come out like bird's claws? There was a, a long period of time that had transpired while he was mentally ill. Warren Worsby said, men and women refuse to submit themselves to God as creatures made by his image. They are in grave danger of descending to the levels of animals. In other words, when we refuse to acknowledge God, we're really in danger of, of descending to that level of an animal. Whereas he says it's worth noting that God used animals when he wanted to describe the great empires of history. In fact, we're going to see that in a couple of chapters that when these uh, empires are described, we're going to be, see them being described as, as animals in Daniel chapter 7. And that the last great world dictator is called a beast. And so we see that when men really go down, they end up being called animal or animal terms within the Bible. But Nebuchadnezzar immediately, boom, just like that, ended up going insane. And his life changed from that point on. Now, there's various medical terms that can be used for this particular condition that he had. I found no less than three terms that people have suggested that, that it was the illness that he ended up having. But whatever the term that it was... When, when he got this mental illness, he literally thought that he was an, an animal. He lived like an animal. He went out, and there's conditions like that. So he ended up living his life like an animal. And in understanding this, it's important for us to know that there's not a whole lot of trees once you get outside of Babylon. You've seen pictures on the news of what it looks like. You've got dirt everywhere. It's, it's desert everywhere. You don't see lush gardens out there. And so this brought this idea from the, the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Perhaps because of his royal position, Nebuchadnezzar was hidden in a secluded park so his true condition could, could be hidden from the populace. Also, in the king's absence, Daniel may have played a major role in preserving the kingdom and the possibility of, in preventing anyone from killing the king. So what's suggested is that with all this dirt on the outside, that there was lush gardens that were around the city of Babylon that were kept separate from, from everyone else, that it's possible that when he lost his mind like that, that Nebuchadnezzar was put in one of the gardens and perhaps the people were slipping him food and, and so forth during that, that particular time. Although the Bible says that, that he was eating grass here. But now we come to part four of the letter in which we see the change in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Take a look at verse 34. And at the end of the, at that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. This proud king, after however long he was gone, had finally hit rock bottom. And when he hit rock bottom, then he looked up and he saw God. You see, he had previously been warned that the kingdom was going to be swallowed up by another kingdom. He, his kingdom was not an eternal kingdom, but what he came to understand through all of this is that God is sovereign and not Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar could want to do whatever he was going to do, but God was greater than him, and God was sovereign, and Nebuchadnezzar finally ends up learning this. And when he did, he began to bless God. And it says, when the king said, I, I bless the Most High, and I praised and I honored him who lives forever and ever. In fact, as you look at the verb, what you find out is it's a continual blessing from that point. He's praising God. He's honoring God. This is something that keeps up because he's finally beginning to understand, which has led many people to believe that Nebuchadnezzar truly converted to the Lord. Now, I don't know for sure whether he did or not. We've seen before that he, he, would, he would acknowledge God and he would go back into his paganism. But this is the swan song for Nebuchadnezzar. This is the final time that we see him or hear about him within the scriptures. And so Nebuchadnezzar here at this point, every indication would be that, 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 that he finally understood that 
the God of Israel is sovereign over all. Verse 35, And all of the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Keep in mind, this is the most powerful king in the world. And finally, he's acknowledging, look, nobody measures up to God. Nobody can hold him down. Nobody can question him. Only God is sovereign and in control, whether we believe it or not. Some of us are wrestling with that today, aren't we? Because we're going through difficulties within our life. We've got heartache that we're trying to deal with, and we're wondering if if God is in control. And yet we find in Romans 8, verse 28, where it says, all things work together for the good of those who love God who have been called according to his purpose. This word sovereignty is a big word. It's a a theological word, but people get scared by theology. And and we really shouldn't because the word theology means the study of God. It's understanding who God is. The Westminster Confession of Faith defines God's sovereignty this way. God from all eternity did by his most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. You say, oh, wow. Well, how about the evil within the world? Does God ordain that to happen? Does God cause that to happen? Absolutely not. Oh, the ordaining, he's worked all that out. But as for causing the evil, absolutely not. There's no evil that's within God. But we know that we've got evil at work within the world, and it's not beyond God to use that evil to bring about his glory. Do you understand that? He can take things that happen. We go out and, and do bad things. Say, say, we, say we go out and rob a bank and we get caught. Well, there's going to be consequences for that. We're going to have to go to jail. We're going to have all of these things that are going to end up happening to us. But through all of that, God may work through that to bring you to Christ. He may work through that to bring other people to Christ, that God is at work in all circumstances within the world for his glory. Verse 36, at that time, my reason returned to me, Nebuchadnezzar says. All of a sudden, as soon as he got to that point, the reason came back to him and he was back like normal. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me and I was restored to, to, to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. So not only did he come back, but things were even better than before. If you take a look at what God did through this this difficult circumstance, number one, once the king returned to God, look at what happens. Number one, God restored the king sanity. He brought the sanity back so that he was no longer insane. God restored the king to his throne after a long absence. Can you imagine being gone seven years and, and then coming back to your throne and, and, and you're brought right back in if in fact he was gone for the full seven? God protected the kingdom during the king's illness. In other words, there were no uprisings in which people took over that kingdom. He protected it just like in, in the dream where he put that, that bond around the, uh, the, the trunk of iron and, and of bronze. Uh, the king's officials and administrators remain loyal to him during that time, which is amazing because when the king's gone, usually people rise up and they want to take over that kingdom, don't they? The king had Daniel to help oversee the, the kingdom in his absence as his prime minister or as his number two man. So Daniel was somehow very much involved in keeping things going as God's word was being fulfilled uh, in, in the kingdom of Babylon. And lastly, once Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the sovereignty of God, God restored the kingdom and he gave Nebuchadnezzar even greater glory and honor than what he had had before. And he'll do the same to us, ladies and gentlemen, if we submit to him. I mean, so often we get mad at God for the things that are happening in our life. And yet we're promised in scripture that all works out for the good. We may not see it this side of heaven. Sometimes it's like having this mountain in front of us. You know, all we can see is the mountain with what we're facing, but God sees over the mountain. He sees down the corridors of eternity, and he has promised to only do what is good for you and for me. Do you think going through difficult times made King Nebuchadnezzar a weaker king or a stronger king? Well, according to this testimony, it made him stronger, didn't it? In fact, uh, and, and, and you are who you are today, because of the experiences you've gone in your life, gone through in your life. The question is, is how are you going to respond to them? Are you going to use them and learn from them? Or are you going to become bitter and angry 
in which it just really messes you up spiritually. Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. What did Nebuchadnezzar learn about pride through all of this? Well, number one, if we get too big for our britches, the tree meaning our life is going to come crashing down. God's going to let it happen for so long, and then that tree is going to end up coming down. Number two, praising God is an important part of genuine worship. When we really come to understand who God is, it's not just, Lord, gimme, gimme, gimme. It needs to be praising Him for who He is and for what He's done. And number three, it is God who ultimately raises kings up and as God who ultimately brings them down. King Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king on earth, found that out at this time. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12, he said, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, what can we learn from today's message? If there's hope for a repentant King Nebuchadnezzar, with all of the things that he did, all of the people that were killed through him, the, the, the city of Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed as an offense to God. If there's hope for a repentant King Nebuchadnezzar, there's hope for us today, no matter what's happened in our life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word and the encouragement here. And Lord, as we've seen this chapter, we've seen the journey that Nebuchadnezzar's gone through and how after this fall and then being raised up again and acknowledging your sovereignty, that you are in control, that the rest of his life here, the remainder of his life was even greater than before. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that not another day would pass, that they would pray a simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I've messed up my life. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and life and help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day I surrender to you and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Lead me to the-